In your Bibles, you should be in Genesis chapter 48 already. Most of us got that out. That's good there. So lesson 39, we'll see how the end of Jacob's life uh, is here. main thing that we're going to see here is the blessings that Jacob gives. We, that was a major part of the life between Isaac, or the transition between Isaac and Jacob, that caused a strife that made Jacob have to run away. And so we're going to see here how Jacob now blesses his 12 sons. Very interesting here. Okay? And then we'll see in the end what happens to uh, Jacob. So, Chapter 48 is where we want to pick up it. Verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And you might say, now why are they not close by each other? Well, we think about it. Joseph was probably in the heart of the land of Egypt where he was handing out grain, whereas Jacob would be out in the land of Goshen. Probably a little, journeys, a little journey away. And they have cars you could quickly get somewhere like we do now. So he takes his two sons to see his father, because he wants them to be blessed by his father. He knows he's near death. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph cometh unto thee, and Israel strengthened himself and sat up upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make thee a multitude of people and will give this land to thy seed for an everlasting possession. So he reminds him of the gift of the promise of the birthright. Verse 5, And now the two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. That's interesting, because when we know of the twelve tribes, which actual son of Jacob is not one of the twelve tribes? Which son of Jacob doesn't actually have a tribe in Egypt? The land of Canaan, named after him. Call him? Joseph. Joseph. There's no tribe of Joseph. Instead, Joseph gets, it seems as though, a double blessing because his two sons, Jacob says here, they are mine. They shall be as Rumid and Simeon, just as they are my sons. Reuben and Simeon are so shall Ephraim and Manasseh be. They will have lands in Canaan named after them. And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance. So again, they're not called the sons of Joseph. They're called the sons of Ephraim and the sons of Manasseh. And as for me, when I came from Paddan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, but yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, These are my sons, whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so that he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them, and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face. And lo, God has showed me also thy seed. So he says, "I, I didn't think I'd ever see you again. Not only did I get to see you again, but I get to see your children. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim, make a picture here, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand. So remember, Joseph's right hand would be going, if Megan holds out her hand that would match up with this one, that's her left hand. And if I take... My left hand, it matches up with Megan's right hand. So he's, he's taking the, the hands of each of the sons, and he places them just like this, and he brings them to his father, one on each side. Okay? So he does that in the end of verse 13, and brought them near to him in verse 14. And Israel stretched out his right hand, and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's, Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn. Okay? So Ephraim is the right hand, and Manasseh is the left hand. So if Megan holds out her hands now, now take your right hand and put it on the first guy's head. Your right hand. That one. Yeah, and the other one goes over here. So what just happened? Well, 
here's the picture. Let's keep going there. Okay. So Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger. Okay. If one is going to bless somebody, okay, typically you would take the right hand and lay it on their head, and that would be the blessing. If there were two, the, the person on the right hand side would go first. Who was arguing about in heaven who was going to sit on the which side of Jesus? If someone is close to you and is your worker, it says, well, this guy is so close to me, he's my blank man hand, Colin. Right hand man. Okay? If one is going to bless one, and there's two people that you're going to bless, the one, the older, the more important one with the right hand, and the lesser one with the left hand. So we think of that. If Jacob and Esau had come before their father Isaac, Isaac would have taken his right hand and put it on Esau's head, and his left hand on Jacob's head. But, that's not the way God wanted it. How did God want, which one did God want to bless? Jacob or Esau? Brody. So it was as though Israel would, or Isaac would have done this. The right hand would have gone on Jacob's head. The same thing happens here. Moses takes the oldest in his left hand, so that it's at his father's right hand side. And he takes the other one, and he thinks, well, the younger one will be... And what does he do? He crosses his hand so that the other one receives the blessing that he thinks should go here. Okay. Verse 15, And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them and the name of my father's Abraham and Isaac let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's head to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son, I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless thee. God shall make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he set Ephraim before Manasseh. And God said unto Joseph, Behold, I die. God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and my bow. So you have one more portion above the rest of your brethren. Your brethren will have one portion in the land of Canaan. You shall have two, and they shall be named Ephraim and Manasseh. Reuben will have one. Joseph's going to get two named after his sons. Okay? Now, we are not going to read in entirety here chapter 49. Okay? But there are some things to point out here. Okay? And I think if we read the first few, you'll get the idea here. Okay? So Jacob now, now that he's blessed Ephraim and Manasseh, he calls in his other sons to him so that he can bless them because he's old, he's aged, and you know, if in the next few days maybe his body's going to wear down and die and he won't be able to speak and talk, so he knows this is the time to bless him. So he calls in the others. Chapter 49 is all about blessing. We're not going to read the whole thing, but we do want to start at verse 3. So who's the oldest son? Kenton? So he's going to bless them in order here. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power unstable as water thou shalt not excel because thou wentest up to thy father's bed and then defiledest thou it he went up to my couch so he's not giving Reuben this great blessing here okay? but he was called unstable as water okay? remember those evil reports the bad reputation that got brought back by Joseph, that's also happening, 
or it's coming to fruition here. All of that life of wickedness and sin, and now he comes before his father hoping for a great rich blessing. And his father tells him that he's unstable as water, always moving this way and that way, and he defiled his father's bed, meaning there must have been the sin of adultery at some point. So Reuben doesn't get that great blessing he's spoken to somehow in a positive way. So let's go on to Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. O my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly. Mine honor, be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they digged down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce in their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Well, that doesn't sound like a blessing. He's pointing out their wickedness and sin. They murdered a man. Judah. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Judah here receives what we might have said was eventually the birthright blessing. The kingdom of Judah, the Jews, who they're named after. This is the line. Judah is the one. If we remember, who stood up and said he would take the place of Benjamin? When Benjamin had the silver cup in his sack. Jaden? Judah. And now, because he has set an example of Christ, he now receives the great blessing of all the blessings of the brothers. Judah, not even Joseph, will the line of Christ be coming from, but it will be from Judah. Okay? The lines of kings shall come from him until Christ comes. Okay? It goes on, and there's other blessings for the other brothers. We're not going to focus upon that. Now we want to see the end of Jacob. In verse, or I'm sorry, chapter 50. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his... Oops. Sorry, I should have started back at the end of, verse, of chapter 49. Let's go back to verse 28. And these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is... It that their father spake unto them and blessed them. Every one according to his blessing, he blessed them. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, and the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife, there they buried Isaac and Rebekah and his wife. And there I buried Leah. I find that interesting. Why is that interesting? Who's not mentioned here? Colin? Favorite? Instead, she's buried under a tree far ways away. You also have Zilpa and Bilha, Zilha and Bilha, they are not buried there. Who was the first marriage of Jacob made to? Jaden? Whether he realizes or is admitting here, I don't know. That this is the one true wife in the eyes of God because there are men who on this earth get married more than once. But in God's eyes, their real true wife is their first one, and that's the only wife. So it's interesting that Leah is buried there, and Jacob now will be buried there with her. That's what he wants. Don't leave my bones when I die here in Egypt. Don't bury them here. Bury them in that cave of Machpelah. Continuing on, verse 32. The purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the ghost. and was gathered unto his people, and Joseph fell upon his father's face, and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, remember these are Egyptians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. 
And forty days were fulfilled for him. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him threescore and ten days. And when the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die in my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan. There shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. Meaning I will return. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father according as he has made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went all of the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house and of the land, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. Okay. So, there we see the final days of Jacob. He died. He did not want to be buried there. After he died, Joseph brought in, now remember, the Egyptians are well known for mummification. They're still celebrated today, right? You can go to museums and see the mummies or a famous thing like King Tut or whatever it may be. The Egyptians were well known for their embalming methods. They did a great job. And so here Joseph, or Jacob is also embalmed. Forty days it sounds like it took him uh, to be embalmed. And, then after, uh, and when the days... Of that were done, and then we see three score and ten days were they in mourning. So for seventy days they mourned him. And when that was done, Joseph then went to the house of Pharaoh and said, Can I bring my father to back to the land where he came from? I promise I'll return. I won't stay there, but I will come back. And Pharaoh gives him permission. So not only did Joseph go, but many Egyptian servants went with him. Probably all of Joseph's brothers and their wives, just the youngest, were left back in Egypt. The herds and the animals along with the servants and the workers and the youngest children were left back, the others would have gone to bury the great patriarch Jacob in the cave of Machpelah. Okay? And so we see all of those things as well. Okay? Now, what's going to happen? What happens after this when they return back to Egypt? Verse 14, please look there. And Joseph returned into Egypt. He and his brethren and all that went with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. So they're worried. Dad is dead. Dad kept Joseph in line, but now that he's dead, now Joseph is going to come after us for selling him into Egypt and mistreating him and hating him. Oh, now he's going to get his revenge. He's going to get us. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph. They're so afraid they sent a messenger. Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of their brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of thy servant of the God thy father. And Joseph went, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? So he's chastising them for bowing down. But what again did that dream say many years ago? What would these brothers be doing to him, Megan? And here again they do that. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Great text for us to remember. We think something is evil, but God meant it for good. To bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you. And your little ones, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. In other words, he says, look, I'm not going to get back at you. God intended this to happen. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived in 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children of also of Maker and the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of the land unto the land which he swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and, he, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. So Joseph here dies too. After he gets done, he becomes old. The famine is gone. He probably lives a nice life, almost a nice, we could say, retirement, probably living well off in the land of Egypt, so that when he dies, he's embalmed and put in a coffin there in Egypt. We can assume 
that the Pharaoh, whoever the Pharaoh was at that time, if it was a, still the same one or a different one, and many of the people in the land all honored Joseph because he had saved them and he had made them wealthy during that time of famine. So he was well honored. So you can imagine this wasn't just a small private service, but a great mourning throughout all the land of Egypt when Joseph died. And so he was embalmed like the Egyptian pharaohs were. He was put into a special coffin. And then there that coffin sat in Egypt. And the one thing Joseph wanted before he died was he made all of the children of Israel. Remember, take my bones with you when you leave. When you leave this land, when God finally takes you out, however long that may be, take me with you. Take the box that my bones are in and bring them back to Canaan and bury me there. Because that's a picture of the promised land. Don't leave me here in this land. I don't want to be buried there. So we see that uh, beautiful request of Joseph. So, uh, we see that there as well. So, the people already could have been looking from the line of Judah. They would know later on by studying the works. From the line of Judah, from the Jews will come a Savior. Now, we don't have to look for the Savior the first time, but we can keep our eyes open and be ready and waiting for Jesus to come again on the clouds of glory to bring us to heaven with him. So that's what we can watch for. They had to look for the Messiah the first time. We need to look for the Messiah the second time here. So uh, that ends the section here with Joseph. Uh, We'll have a review and then a test, and then our next group of section of lessons will start up with the life of Moses, beginning there in Exodus.